Return again. Return again. Return to the land of your soul. Return again. Return. All right. Welcome, everybody. We have returned mid January. Some of us in lockdown, some of us in less lockdown, I think. <laughs> Thank God we live in interesting times. Um, we are just starting today a pre-series discussion. We have four questions we're going to go through together. And uh, because of some elections in Africa, we've, uh, we're having to wait until next week to have all of our friends from Uganda join us. Um, there's some issues with internet accessibility there. And uh, so we're going to welcome them next week. So what that means is this week we have a smaller audience than usual. Um, however, I just wanted to encourage everyone to think about the greater audience who's going to watch this video after we've uh, had the discussion, post on the website. People want to catch up uh, just before we start our series next week with Ravdo. Um, so with that, everyone in the panelists here is known to us, but I would like to mar uh, welcome Margaret to our discussion today. Hi, Margaret. I see you're- Hi, how are you? I'm doing very well. Hi. Glad to have you with us. Um, Good to have you, Margaret. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, everybody. It's a privilege. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, Margaret, you're in Kenya. That's right. In, yes, in Nairobi, Kenya. Yes. Nairobi, Kenya. And mm -hmm. uh, the Canadian part of me wants to ask you how the weather is in Nairobi, Kenya right now, because that's what we do when we say hi to people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, the weather is good. It's um, moderate, neither warm nor cold. Okay. It's just fine, yes. Yeah. So you uh, just, I, I wanna ask you a few questions. I hope you don't mind if I put you on the spot just a little bit, because I wanna introduce you to everyone else who's in the panel, is that okay? That's okay, that's okay. Great, so you've been involved with the uh, Africa Prayer Altar. Um, yes, I have, yes. Can you just tell us just a little bit about what that is? Uh, what we're involved in is uh, prayer for Israel. Um, We've been doing this since 2006, the last 14 years. And we link up with the Messianic Jews in Israel to try and bring an understanding of the place of Israel in relation to the church and to the nations. So we do lots of teaching and travel around the continent to raise altars of prayer to pray for Israel. Awesome, thank you. Well, we're really glad to have you with us. Uh, thank you. The, um, I would like to see, I wonder if we could get uh, maybe some of the questions up on the screen. Uh, I have them on my screen on the side because I have two screens here, but um, we have, so we, we had four questions that we sent out to the panelists and um, we're gonna get to those four questions. But I'd like to just ask if anyone on the panel, before we start, has any thoughts that they would like to share before we start attacking questions. I'm just opening the floor to you guys to, uh, to share if there's anything on your mind, on your heart. The silence is an answer. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to the first question. Get the ball rolling. Uh, it would be nice if we could have on the screen. If we don't, I'm, I'm going to read it uh, here. I guess maybe I could share my screen, couldn't I? Yeah, share your screen, Doug. Um, yeah, I'll do that. I'm going to share my screen. Well, to most of you. So let's start with question one. Uh, I'm just going to read it out loud, and then uh, we can start pecking away at it and uh, see where we go. So Moses demands that Pharaoh let my people go. For what purpose? Does this rallying call extend beyond Egypt and Israel, and does it remain relevant today? Gabe, could you just so, mention uh, what passage we're studying today, the reference for it? 
Do you, do you see my screen right now? We sure do. Okay, I thought maybe it might be more helpful because we have here the questions, uh, but we also have some of the context in terms of, for example, we see it's Exodus 5.1. There you go. Um, okay, mm -hmm. I think that might uh, help facilitate uh, the discussion. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think typically we assume, and I remember also from uh, many years assuming that God is, a, is essentially demanding to free the Jews from slavery. And uh, it also seems to have uh, been universally understood that way because this verse is always, is very often used in that context. But I think that if we look at carefully at the verse itself, for example, here, verse 5-1, it says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a festival for me in the wilderness. That's a bit different than uh, commanding Pharaoh to free them. It also kind of perhaps raises another question, which I think is an important question that is very strongly related, which is if we say, let my people go means to free them from slavery, is this synonymous with what we see here in the verse? What does freedom mean? Interesting question. Yeah, my thought immediately, <clears throat> my mind goes to the idea that you can't you can't just be set free. You have to be set free unto something. There needs to be a transition of um, occupation. And I think that maybe that's part of the role of celebrating feast or we would often think of, you know, let them worship me, that they might worship me, let, you know, let my people go that they might worship me. The idea there that there's a transition and something has to occupy the empty space that comes from that. And I think that's very, that's very fascinating what you're saying. I would like to take that even a little bit further. Okay, so what exactly, are, some might say that they're trading slavery to Pharaoh for a slavery to God. Is that really what we're talking about yeah. here? Okay. I, I think so the word slavery- I'm very slavery. happy with that, with, with that, with, with that uh, transformation from slavery, one slavery to a, a lower slavery to a higher, higher kind of slavery, which is a slavery to God. I'd like to propose though, that it might really be something quite different. Um, because one of the things that we have to remember is that in the very beginning of chapter six, which follows this, um, verse two, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac and John, and as El Shaddai, but I did not make myself known to them by my name, uh, Yud Ke Vav Ke, the, how do you say that again? The Tentra Remen? Okay. So, so we've got these, these four letter, this special name that God proclaims that even the forefathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob did not know this name and um, this is going to be a new revelation of God in the world because God's different names reveal themselves, reveal different relationships or they express different relationships. For example, El Shaddai. El Shaddai is a relationship of a mother to a nurturing a baby because Shaddai is what uh, is, 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 uh, is the nursing of, of, of a child. It comes from the, sh the Shaddaim, from the Shaddai. So in many ways, God is now saying, I am ready for the next stage in the development of man. We start in the stage of babyhood, which begins in the Garden of Eden, and we're going to uh, study that with Rabdov next week. But 
here, now we're about to move up to the next level. And in this next level, the baby is used to everything being given to it. it God gives us everything that we need. That's really God's uh, uh, one way of revelation is that he simply takes care of us like babies. But here he says, God wants to be known by a different name, ultimately for all time, which is this name, Yudke Vavke, or it's translated here, the Lord. And here in, in the Lord, we actually know what it means when God talks about celebrate a festival for me. It's a festival for the Lord, right? Because the next verse, Paro says, who is the Lord? I don't know that kind of a name that I should heed him and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord and I won't let Israel go. So there's something really special about this name. This name reflects a certain kind of relationship which is revealed for the first time on Mount Sinai because it says here, celebrate a festival for me in the wilderness. And on Mount Sinai, they're going to suddenly discover a different kind of revelation of God with man. Is that a, a revelation of slavery? If we try to think of what this amazing experience in Sinai was like, it was a relationship where they hear the word of God, where God reveals himself completely in a, so that every single person was there hears God speaking to them. And in that case, it's the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, there's no slavery there. They're, they're rules, yes. If you want to have a relationship with God, you want to have a special, really deep relationship with God where, where you can hear his, Him speaking within us. If you can hear, the, have that kind of a relationship, they're rules. You can't murder, you can't, you can't do a, a bunch of other things. And you know what? You have to respect your parents and you have to also... Um, uh, keep the Sabbath, which is a really big deal in the Ten Commandments for the first time. Um, Dina. Hi. Yes. A few words. Hi. I, I just think the Lord is a very bad translation. It's, you know, it's so hard to translate Hebrew well. Yeah. But it does have... We say Hashem, I think. It makes it a lot easier. Yeah, we don't pronounce it the way it's written in the Hebrew. Uh, you know, the witnesses, they, they have that, that they take those four Hebrew letters and pronounce it the way they want, uh, the J witnesses, but we don't even say that word. Um, it, it's, it's a very interesting four letters. It's called the Tetragrammaton from the Greek four letters, but it has something to do perhaps with the fact that it's vowels. It's something that's considered very much um, connected to I will be that will I will, which I will be. The, the I will be is similar letters. It's just these four letters in Hebrew, the Yud, the He, the Vav, and the He. And it connotes, according to many commentaries and rabbis and over the years, biblical scholars, it connotes some kind of um, providence, a closer relationship, a hands-on, so to speak, relationship, as opposed to Lord, you know, which is high up in heaven, a special relationship with this people which will be um, providential, where there's divine providence, caring, uh, walking with the people, so to speak. Not only that, but when he says later on, what, what, what should I tell the people? He says, I will be who I will be. And it's in that same chapter, using the same letters, using the same letters then we know that God in some ways is placing himself in our hands. He's basically telling us that I will be what you choose. In other words, God wants a partnership relationship where mankind initiates, where mankind is truly free. So that's really the point that I'm trying to make that this is not a transformation from one form of slavery, a lower form to a higher form. God really wants to redeem mankind from slavery period. And that we'll name, see this you know, more and more. You know, that, that was a, a novel called God is a Verb. And you know, when you think about a living God, the name somehow seems to, to be something more living. Listen, I really appreciate what, what you're saying, Ian Dina. 
Um, and and I and I, you know, it, and I think it's interesting, especially for the Christians that are with us here today. When 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 you say that let my people go that they might worship me, okay, you're not thinking of a worship service, so to speak. Okay, you're not thinking of okay. Uh, let's let's begin singing uh, uh, to God immediately in your Jewish uh, uh, paradigm. You are immediately thinking worship from a place of service. Okay, and you immediately connected that with, uh, with. Pardon me. It beyond service. It's a partnership. That was to serve God it, together. No, 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 no. But, but I know where you're going or where you've gone. But what I'm sure, saying sure. is you've, you've, you've brought this word slavery up, and we don't see it anywhere in the question, okay? But yet we all know, whether you're a Jew or no, that they left the slavery of a pharaoh from northern Africa, from Egypt, Okay. But the fact that you're thinking in a different term is really what I want to emphasize because I love this concept of cooperation and partnership, but it means we have to make a decision that I'm not going to submit to the rules of Egypt any longer, and I'm not going to submit to a feral any longer, that I have an opportunity to change my, find a new leader, find a new director, uh, and, and, and that is Hashem. He's saying, I want to make myself known to you, and I want you to make a, a free will choice to submit to me and the instructions or the rules of my kingdom, and you're going to have a much greater life because we're going to cooperate in this thing together. Correct? Okay. And I think it's important yeah. as Christians that we see this kind of worship. Because I can't look at the book of Exodus, you know, I know you call it uh, in English Exodus, I call it Aliyah, okay? So the, and, and I, I, I remember a friend who also lives in your community, Phaedra Shapiro, she always, whenever I brought my groups to uh, Mitzvah Netafa, she would always say, listen, I know you're looking at Aliyah, getting them out of the nations, getting them out of Egypt, into the wilderness, uh, on their way home, uh, getting to Ben Gurion Airport, just, but see Alia as something about drawing closer to God. And I think we have to do the same thing with the word Exodus, that we are making the Exodus to worship the holiest God on earth. And the process is, is in righteousness, uh, which will lead to a holiness. And God is giving us this option to be able to move in that direction. And, and, and if I dare say, it's not just for Jewish people. Uh, exactly. it's, it's for those from the nations. And, and I think what it's we mankind. realize here, yeah, exactly, all mankind. But I think what we realize he, here with Enom is we can probably make this Aliyah, this Exodus, this greater submission to this, this greater... Uh, creator of the universe from a place of doing it together. And, and, I, and I, I really feel that when we answer the second part of this question, is it relevant today for us? I think that's the exodus that we are all making. It's not, I'm not going to just do this as a Christian. I'm not going to do this just as a Jew, but I want to find the value before a holy God, the creator of the universe, of entering into this worship together of this one God, the God who covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so I say this is very relevant today. Not only is it relevant today, but notice the whole tone. It's not about come and worship me in the desert. He says, I want you to come and celebrate with me in the desert. It's a celebratory relationship. What does Pharaoh do? What does Pharaoh do? He does the exact opposite. I'll show you what it is to be the God, right? Because he, he, Ra, he's the son of Ra. He's Ra, which in Hebrew happens to mean also evil. I am the son of evil. His way, uh, his relationship with his people is one where I'll show them, you know, they're they have too much time to think about these kind of things, and I'm going to 
make their, their slavery even more bitter, more difficult by taking away their uh, raw materials, the same quota of Brits as we see later on. So we see that God, what God really is trying to do here, or he's starting to do here, is he's welcoming Pharaoh and his people to join in on this. He's talking to them, uh, you should submit to the God of Israel. And Pharaoh says, I never heard of such a thing. He can't even conceive in his paradigm that a relationship with a God could be celebratory, that a relationship with a God should be from a place of true freedom, where a person, where, where, where God places himself many, in many ways in our hands and says, I will empower you and I will be your partner and you can determine your future. That is like such a foreign notion for a leader like Pharaoh. That, that there is a hierarchy. If you're a slave, you're always a slave. Your children will be slaves. Your grandchildren will be slaves. So I think um, what I was saying before, oh, go ahead, Ruth. Well, I was just going to say that I was thinking about the word when Pharaoh says he doesn't know God and God tells Moses that by his name, the patriarchs didn't know him. They're talking about um, Yodea, which is a intimate kind of experiential knowledge. And uh, what I think God is saying is now I'm going to let you experience me in a way that you haven't before. And one of the differences is that uh, God revealed himself to the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by talking to them and intermittent experiences of them. But in this case, he's going to allow the whole entire nation of Israel to experience being set free from Egypt and walking through the Red Sea on dry land and the defeat of the Egyptians. So not only was that something... So in multiple places, it says that the reason why God was doing this rather than just Moses taking the people out was so that the Egyptians would know who the real God was. And mm -hmm. when the Israelites get to the Jordan and they cross into Jericho, the people in Jericho say, we heard what God did in Egypt and we're terrified of you. So not only did the Egyptians know, but all of the nations in the area of the Middle East knew what the real God did. And the second thing I was going to say is that all of the plagues are directed at the gods of Egypt. I'll just give two examples, but one of them is Ra, the sun god, um, was the one who Pharaoh was supposed to be the son of. Uh, one of the plagues was darkness. So God's message is, it's not you that's in control of light. It's not your God, it's me. I can darken the world. And the, another example is uh, they worship cows and they worship frogs. So those are the things that God showed that he was actually in charge of and not them in charge of. I think one of the most amazing aspects of what we've just described is that um, to a Pharaoh who can't even get this paradigm because it's so foreign to him, all they're really asking for is a week's vacation, which would appear to be, you know, like nothing. All these, these guys work for you 24 seven and they're now asking for a week's vacation. Yeah. But he's not willing to give them even that week's vacation. What God is really asking for is much deeper than that because as soon as they get to know him and they become they free themselves of the slavery paradigm, then even if they, if they come back, think of it, if they come back and they start, and the, and the Egyptians around them start seeing this transformed people who is now in relationship with God, kind of like after the experience at Sinai, and they come back, then all the Egyptians will also want to get to know the same God. And basically it will indeed be the redemption of all of civilization at that time. But we'll see later on in the story that Pharaoh didn't let that happen. That everything that he tries to do actually results in the opposite of which what he tries to achieve. But I think just recognizing the fact that God is, is, is just asking 
to allow the Jewish people who God says is are my people, just allow me to have a relationship with them. And Pharaoh is not able to accept that. And in fact, as we can see, for many, many years, mankind resisted this type of thing, perhaps because they couldn't understand it. Thank God today we live in an age where we have Christians who certainly can understand it, and there are others. And this is, like you said, Dean, an opportunity for all of us together to learn how to fulfill God's purpose in this world together. Um, and, 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 and that's that's very exciting to me. Yeah, I think one of the things yeah, that ahead. happened is that we, we stop too soon. We see the story of coming out of Egypt. And that's where we stop from slavery into freedom. And at least three times in the account, it says that God brought them out of Egypt, that he might bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey. It, it was a transition that, that we limit. We, we want the freedom, but the whole power structure in, in Egypt was power. You impose your will on everybody else and you don't allow any other opinion. And any opinion that starts to rise, you put down. So you take the materials away and say you're not working hard enough if you've got time to think. Um, but it's that process of being brought out in order to be brought in to something that's new. And I think the relationship we're talking about is a relationship that is founded on love, not on power. Right. That's why it's celebratory, right? Beautiful. So I just want to invite Margaret, if you had some thoughts to share on this, we'd love to hear it. Um, oh, thank you. I'm just thinking of the whole experience of Israel in Egypt, um, becoming just like the last uh, speaker has stated, it was a coming out of something into something. And I see that they are coming out and the ultimate goal is not just uh, the coming out, but is coming home. They are coming home and us Christians together with, you see that our coming home is really coming to the God of Israel. And I think that was the most, the whole Exodus experience is like, it was the coming out of that slavery where other gods, the gods that were that ruled Egypt, the gods that the Egyptians served, as one speaker stated, uh, there was such evidence that there is no other God but the God of Israel because he was able to vanquish all those gods that the Egyptians worshiped. I think the 10, the gods that represented the 10 plagues uh, were defeated. And then they were called to come and celebrate. What is important here uh, is that they were not celebrating when they were in Egypt, but when they come out, they are coming into a celebration. And I think the final destination is that they are coming home and coming home to the God of Israel, which is the most important thing. And I see that this is also the experience of those who are Christians that coming out of slavery and coming home to a place of celebration out of bondage, out of, um, out of bondage, out of sin, out of things that have held you in slavery and you're coming to a place of celebrating freedom. Uh, this is what I see the experience of Exodus as being uh, that you're coming out but the most important destination is to get home and home is where the Lord is. That's yeah. how I, I view it. And that's how it uh, applies to the nations. Thanks so much for joining us so we can enjoy your beautiful thoughts. 
Um, I want to turn the conversation just a little bit uh, in relevance to also the question we've been talking about relationship in answering the question for what purpose. Uh, however, we also see something else. And uh, in uh, Shmot, in Exodus chapter um, six, we see when God is speaking to Moshe, and he is really revealing himself to Moshe. He's revealing his name as has been spoken about today. He also says this, he says, Anishamati, I have heard. And he uses the word na'achat, which is the groanings, which that's exactly what it means, the deep crying that is relevant to something that is anguish, deep sorrow. And then he goes on to say, he also, he says, beriti, and I have remembered my covenant. And I think this is also extremely connected to the name because you have the two hays that are in the yud ke vav ke. Those two hays are connected to the new uh, hay that was added to Avram's name and the hay that was added to Sarah's name. So this covenant, uh, is really being carried on and through. So we hear this not only right here, we hear this before in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where we find that God says, I hear the cry, I hear the groaning. This is so serious that I have to come down myself and see if it's true. So Israel from the beginning of its house was ordained to make sacrifice and worship Hashem. And being in Egypt, she is now off course and she's got to come home, which has been so beautifully expressed tonight. However, from Hashem's point of view, what he starts to hear is such anguish and such sorrow. He cannot wait any longer. In fact, it was supposed to be 400 years. And I believe we're just shy of 300 years now, about 280. And they're in the wilderness. And Hashem said, I can't even wait till 400 years. And I think you talk about relevance today. We talk about human trafficking. We talk about sex slave trafficking. Margaret brought up, uh, you know, the bondage of the soul just because of its, uh, uh, because of the elements that it's exposed to in sin, adultery, idolatry, and we can go on and on. But I think about today that Hashem's ear is really leaning down because he's hearing this incredible anguish across the globe, the soul that is crying out. And he's remembering two things, not only that he made a covenant with the house of Israel, but also that through Avraham, he promised that he was gonna find a way into the nations and he was going to make a way for them to be redeemed, to be set free. And I think Hashem, is in this place right now, today, that he's remembering these covenants and he's hearing these cries, mm -hmm. just like he did with, with uh, B'nai Israel uh, back in the time of the Exodus. Are you suggesting that the 10 plagues that follow are somehow related to what we're going through today? <laughs> uh, so really? In our oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, both of you. OK, first of all, there's there's some things that are being said that we got to arrest for a moment. Number one, uh, backing up a little bit further, you uh, Kim, what's this 280 years like? No, no, just 210, 210, just to be. Uh, I think yeah, I think well, what do you mean? Yeah. Excuse me. Excuse me. I come from the school of this 400 years business. OK, and now you're just going to flippantly throw these numbers out that it might have been quite a bit no, less. I'll, I'll, I'll make it easier for you, Dean. It's not that complicated. They're 400 <laughs> years from the moment that they were exiled, right? Some some count from the birth of yeah. Isaac, some of some from the time when they were had to leave their home, as Margaret spoke about so beautifully. So there's, there's a distinction between the number of years of being in exile and not being home Versus the number of years that they were actually, I mean, we, there were actually two transition governments. I mean, you know, you know, we're, we're also in that right now. 
Uh, but there were, there were two new pharaohs uh, that we hear about in these meetings. And uh, apparently the, the, the real slavery that we're talking about where we had all these groaning was 210. Listen, thank you very much. That, that, that adds uh, one dimension. Now, Kim, I'm not finished with you, my dear. Is because uh, I think what you're saying is very interesting, and I had these thoughts these last couple weeks too. That the foundation of this book of Exodus and even weaves it through is about hearing and listening, you know, and that this great uh, holy God that created the universe really wants people to hear Him, and even as listening to Him. And I, 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 I pick up with all these different things, this hearing and listening. And so I think you're really, you know, you're connecting with something. And of course, as we continue to read Exodus, we, we see that there's a, a struggle with this hearing and listening pretty much right through the entire book. Uh, the other thing I want to say, too, because we've touched on these plagues, is I feel God is interested in introducing himself to everyone whether you're enslaved in Egypt or whether you're some of the nations beginning to know this great God who with his great and mighty right hand delivers his people out of Egypt. And he does it a specific way. He does it with judgments. And I feel that this is a, a huge announcement that he wants people to hear, see, and really listen to is, is that he's not just a God of love and nor just a God of righteousness as Jeremiah, uh, you know, wanted us to understand, but he's also a God of justice. He's also a God of judgment. And the way he brings his people out of Egypt, even to the extent that he would need to have to harden Pharaoh's heart, because if he didn't harden Pharaoh's heart, he may have left these people leave a lot earlier because God wanted the world he wanted the Jewish people, but he also wanted nations to know he is also a God of judgment. And he defines this in the book of Exodus in an amazing way that you can't leave this book. You can't leave it without understanding, wow, this God means business with anybody and everybody that would have anything to do with him. I need to get hold of a fear of God. Uh, a healthy fear of God from a place that I can enter into this relationship, not uh, imagining him like I want to imagine him to be like me, but I need to understand who he is and I need to conform to that likeness. And, uh, and I, think, I think I see that getting established here. I want to bring in, and uh, Kim, I think this was for me personally tucked into something you said there. Uh, the question about Shifra and Pua and their disobedience to authority for in submission to perhaps a greater authority, a greater moral authority. And um, is there anything with respect to their lives uh, that we can learn um, and apply in our own day? Well, I would love to chime in. <laughs> On that one, please, please go ahead. <laughs> if I may, uh, I think we had talked about this in one of our meetings, but I I would love to read to you um, what uh, Rabbi Sachs says about that, um, because this is usually looked at these great women that uh, they just don't pay attention. Uh, they save lives, but there's a principle that is being released here that is really going to become something I think that is extremely valuable for the time in which we live. And that is the principle, there are moral limits to power. And uh, they did not obey Paro because it was immoral. They, to murder is immoral. It's in fact, we're not even at Sinai yet. We are not even hearing the 10 commandments yet. The conscience alone knows it's immoral. And so let me read this very brief comment. 
uh, from Rabbi Sachs, the Honorable Rabbi Sachs of Blessed Memory. He passed just a couple months ago now. Um, and that is about Shifra and Puah. It says the significance of this story is that it is the first recorded instance of one of Judaism's greatest contributions to civilization. The idea that there are moral limits to power. There are instructions that should not be obeyed. There are crimes against humanity that cannot be excused by the claim that I was only obeying orders. This concept generally known as civil disobedience is usually attributed to the 19th century American writer, Henry David Thoreau and entered international consciousness after the Holocaust and Nuremberg trials. Its true origin though, lies thousands of years earlier in the actions of two women, Shifra and Pua. And you know, they were not Jewish women, they were most likely Egyptian women. And altogether the role of women in this whole story is so vital, so crucial. We would not have gotten anywhere without these women. I think it's also very interesting to see how God reward, re, uh, rewards them. Because if you look at the bottom of the page right now, he established households for them. And what is the expression of establishing households for them mean? It, it isn't, it doesn't mean that God built a house for them. It's, we, we know later on, we hear throughout the prophets, about the house of Israel and the house of Joseph. Houses are essentially um, families that, 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 go, that, that live beyond a generation, from generation to generation. That's really what- You're like a dynasty. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry? A dynasty, he said. A dynasty, great. So essentially we see that God is not just building a, an Israeli dynasty here. He's also building dynasties for all who accept his um, who, who accept his moral law, who, who want to abide by God's uh, sense of justice, as Dean mentioned earlier. So I think it's really very, very beautiful to see here, as we said before, this is not just about the redemption of Israel. This is the redemption of all mankind and any who uh, truly accept God's uh, moral code uh, becomes rewarded by him because he wants to partner with everyone. I agree, and it's interesting uh, how this term, uh, God-fearer, uh, becomes applied to the, um, the God-fearer becomes applied to anyone who is outside of the house of Israel who is taking hold of the 10 commandments and the moral laws and moral codes of God. God begins to really put a, almost to mark them as a God fearer. And that is, uh, he's, he's like, I'm going after them. I'm bringing them into the house, you know? So. Yeah, it's beautiful. There's some songs that we sing in the temple uh, Yirei Hashem, uh, it, 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 how does it go? It, it says, uh, um, it, it talks about Beit Aaron, Baruch Et Hashem, and then the last line it says, Yirei Hashem, Baruch Et Hashem. May the fearers of God bless God. You know, so they should all say Baruch Hashem. We know that the first ones say Baruch Hashem or Gentiles in the Bible. And we, we, so we really have this notion of all of us ultimately celebrating in God's house together uh, with the Yirei Hashem, the fear, those who fear God joining in so that we can all thank him and celebrate uh, him, God, uh, Hashem uh, together in his house. Just to, to add back to uh, 
this woman by the name of uh, Pua, who's one of the midwives. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in Judges chapter 10, it says, after the time of Abimelech, a man of Issachar, Tola, son of Pua, okay, the son of Dota, rose to save Israel. Oh, okay. I, I don't know if this is the same Pua, and I, maybe Yair or Dina, you can speak to this, uh, uh, or Kim, but what's interesting is when you speak about households, Yair, you mm -hmm. know, this is sort of like evidence of a household, and more than that, the same DNA of that household, which is to save Israel, is in this woman who's now part of Israel. Uh, I mean, is there Talmudic uh, evidence that connect this woman with the same woman in Exodus chapter one? So oh, such a, first of all, a, a, a wonderful um, insight, just uh, seeing that connection. I would have to go revisit, of course, to see what the Talmud has to say about it. I don't remember offhand. But I do remember that in the Talmud, there is a very serious discussion as to whether we're talking about an Israelite Pua or a uh, Egyptian Pua. And the tendency is more towards the Egyptian. And uh, I think that what we see all around, just like we see this later on also with Yael, the, 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 the Kaini, right? Uh, with Sisra and with Dvora, where she plays a role also in saving uh, Israel by killing uh, Sisra, and the later on is very highly and and again it's there are there are many uh, like Jethro like others who tied their destiny together with Israel, and God mm -hmm. rewards them as we see with uh, with, with with generations that. Uh, that ultimately share in the, uh, in the in the destiny of Israel. And I think it's a very beautiful thing. So God you, essentially you, builds our homes so that we should build his house. Uh, right, he builds our, the, our houses so that we should build his house and come together. So you think there might be a relevancy for those of us in the nations that could very well take on the attitude of a, a Shifra or a Pua uh, and begin to uh, live a life where we would be we would be like these people uh and take on their example that there might be rewards for us too no no dean you're doing it already <laughs> this is better than aeroplan uh this aeroplan doesn't work right now my rewards program in the airlines does not work right now i like this program <laughs> all of you, I think, are are in your own communities and your own lives, and all that you're doing are are just like they are, just right up there with the Shifra and Fuaz uh, Fuaz of, of the world. Praise Lord! I, I I I'm I'm being a little bit facetious because I really believe it. However, our goal and our objective need that reward system. I think if we can go back to what Rick said in the beginning, if we can do it out of a, out of a basis and a foundation for love, love of God and love of our neighbor, uh, I, I, the, the rewards will just flow. Uh, and, and, and I think that's really important to emphasize great reward system, but let that not be our motive because that connects us to that other system that the pharaoh had in egypt and we're coming out of that system we're still coming out of that yes. system today and uh i i believe when we realize that there is a greater kingdom with uh, a holier god uh and that he's inviting us to have this relationship with him so that we might hear and and see more effectively uh you know you just you're 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 doing it out of love. You're not doing it out of I can get this, I can get that. Unconditional. But you know, also it's interesting that Shifra and Pua did not have to convert, did not have to become Israelites. Oh. It's where they were in the profession that they had already, that the opportunity arose, and they stood up, and they did the right thing, and they risked their lives, and they saved, and they saved the people. 
So I think wherever people are, wherever God has placed you, wherever your soul chose to be, and I, by the way, I'm putting a little plug for the movie Soul, which is just beautiful. <laughs> oh, I saw it, I saw it. That's <laughs> wonderful, the new Disney Pixar. So sort of wherever you are in your life, you have an opportunity to do the right thing and to do God's work. Well, good work, 10 points, top of the class. More than that, because I think what we see is the <laughs> slide that I, the last slide that I have here, with the question about the role of the strangers, is that we can see that not only are those who connect with, with the God of Israel rewarded, but that Israel needs, needs, needs you. We actually need the strangers. I don't think that it's coincidental that strangers play such crucial roles in the redemption of Israel and later on in various uh, um, uh, generations later because Israel really needs the stranger. We need the stranger. We need, it. We, we need them uh, to play very important roles. And we also need them for, for ourselves. Um, I, I really, I find this studying together with, with, with you is, is just such a pleasure. And it completely raises my study of Torah to a higher level. It's like, it's amazing how this togetherness in the study of Torah uh, elevates everyone who's involved in this. So I think the role of the stranger is, is huge. And especially when we see story like the daughter of Pharaoh who ends up saving the redeemer, right? Moses, Moses. In many ways, Moses himself is somewhat of a stranger because he didn't really grow up within the uh, Israeli society at that time, but he actually had to grow in the house of Pharaoh. So his growing up in the house of Pharaoh was perhaps necessary for him to be able to facilitate the process that he has to facilitate. And, uh, and, and Moses is a, a stranger when he goes and he saves the daughters of Jethro from the other shepherds. And we just see it again and again and again, how sometimes the stranger is crucial in order to facilitate what God wants, which is to really take care of the needy and to take care of those who need assistance. Um, God created us as strangers in the land of Egypt purposely before we could become a people so that we know what it means to be a stranger and so that we will also know how to relate properly to strangers. So we see that this whole thing about a stranger, Abraham being a stranger in the land for a bit, and it's just so central to the, the blueprint that God has for this world. We need strangers. And, and, and maybe the world also needed us as strangers when we went out to exile. It's like the, the, the just coming together with people who, are, who, who come up with the, who are brought up differently, can be such uh, an enriching experience. I've certainly enjoyed that with uh, so many of you uh, over the last 10 years. I was thinking about this. There's a deeper challenge with the concept of a stranger because we wrestle with each other over what we think is objectively true. And I don't know if that's a more of a modern problem uh, in contrast with more ancient civilizations where there was a bit more isolation and I think a little bit less of the tug of war. Uh, but I think a part of the challenge with the stranger for a modern mindset is that we tend to, I'm obviously I'm sharing as a Westerner, a Canadian, uh, we tend to very quickly try to weigh everything that is shared or said or communicated as being a and we very quickly can become combative and uncomfortable the moment we identify something we don't agree with and that we don't think is true mm -hmm. and more than that sometimes we can feel assaulted and feel like our children are being assaulted and feeling like our our, our perception of reality is being assaulted mm -hmm. um by right and so I wonder if that's a part of the conundrum mm -hmm. because uh, I, I think it's one of the challenges that Israel's faced in the nations is that Israel's had an idea of what 
For example, we just made references to certain moral truths that we hold to be evident, right? You shouldn't murder your neighbor. Well, that's not evident to everybody. It's not evident all over the world. It's not evident mm -hmm. necessarily to people, you know, even and it can be separated between castes within society that you'll have certain people who think we need to kill some to save some. And it's really just that simple, the metric, you know? So I'm just, I'm thinking about some of the challenges that we face when we get past well-meaning rhetoric into the day-to-day -day challenge of that wrestling match, you know, and, um, I don't know. That's more of a more of a question than it is an answer. It's Very just kind good. of more that. Very good thought. We're gonna have more of that wrestling to do in the future, so it's not going away. That's a that's a very good thought. Mm -hmm. uh, can just briefly, can I return us back to Dean and uh, what we were? He was mentioning about the ten plagues. Going back to the plagues, I am. Um, I had an experience many, many, many years, gotta be at least 30 years ago. And I have happened to go to, I was part of the Orthodox uh, Jewish community in Chicago. And I just happened to go to a, a ladies uh, lunch study one day. And the teacher, I can't remember her name now, but she brought out something that has stayed with me all of these years. And it is from this week's Torah portion, Bo. And this is where we wrap up all of the plagues. And the uh, last plague, of course, is the death angel. And in uh, Exodus chapter 11, it says um, in the English, and I'll read this in the English. Uh, it says, and Moses said, thus saith the Lord, about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Paro that sitteth upon his throne, even to the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill and the firstborn of the cattle. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt as there has none been none like it. Uh, now there will be nothing like it ever again. And, uh, but against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog wet his tongue. And it goes on from there. But the focus of that conversation was why about midnight? Mm. First of all, why in two things, just why didn't Moshe say to Pharaoh at midnight? Why did he say about midnight? And the second thing is, why midnight? And it really brought home something Dean said, that first about midnight, and the reason he said about midnight is because he did not want to give Paro any reason to point the finger at God or to, to have a, an, a, an excuse for why. Okay. But the why midnight, this is what she said. The reason God chose midnight is because is, it is the darkest point. It's actually a point where, where it's the darkest hour of the day and it's also the beginning of light. It is the place where judgment and mercy meet. Wow. Judgment upon the Egyptians, mercy upon the Israelites. And this is the, the most phenomenal point is that in this obscure place that we cannot see at midnight, it actually starts to turn light. We are now turning back the clock. Everything's leading up to it and then everything's turning back. So when she said that, this is the place where judgment and mercy meet. I thought, what a moment to bring such a judgment upon the Egyptians. And this is where we see the connection between justice and judgment. The God that we serve, he is not a God of judgment just to be a God of judgment. He is a God of justice first. And the very thing that the, uh, the Egyptians did to the Israelites by murdering 
the firstborn sons. This, uh, this sin against God, which was, of course, horrific, uh, it comes full circle to them because God is a God of justice. So I thought when we're talking about the issues of judgments and the, the purpose, there is never a time that God allows something in which it is not connected to his nature, which is in his name <laughs> of his righteousness and his justice. And so I, I just had that on my heart to share. Wow. That's beautiful. Uh, Jim, I'd like to uh, respond to that uh, just with the idea that mercy and judgment are expressions of the same thing in that I see, you know, when we see the two contrasting images of Israel being set free to go into the wilderness to meet with God and to, to worship God and, Israel, and uh, Egypt being judged in a way, I, I kind of like to see that the judgment of Egypt is actually the precondition for Egypt to be able to join Israel to worship and to know God. I, right? I because so I was just reading the story of Gideon today. And somehow uh, I had totally forgotten that one of the first things that God asked Gideon to do, I'm sorry, I'm taking another Bible passage and I'm bringing it in, but I just need to. Okay. Oh, is Go he ahead. asked Gideon to destroy an Asherah pole and an altar to Baal that his family, his father was involved with in the city that he was involved with. And so that was a form of judgment. The people in the city got very upset and they came and they said, we're going to kill Gideon. And then his father saved his life. And well, God saved his life through his father. Uh, and so I'm just saying there's a parallel here where you see like the smiting of an altar in Israel and an Asherah pole in Israel causing great unrest and upset. And you see in Egypt, the, the striking of the firstborn, the sun god, the frog god, the, you know. And uh, Margaret, I just want to bless you as being someone who's connected to Egypt. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as God has declared blessing for Egypt. And that the judgments upon Egypt was actually a form of preparation for liberty for the Egyptians. Because his heart for the Egyptians and his heart for Israel are not... Mm -hmm different you know and it's that idea of heat melts wax and it hardens clay mm -hmm. love judges and is merciful and they're expressions of the same thing a loving kindness and a generosity and a mm -hmm. favor in a way you know for mm -hmm. mankind and wow. that was just you know and I, I think also in connecting to right at the beginning of our discussion today Yair, when you brought up this idea of was Israel set free from slavery to Pharaoh to slavery to God, I would say that this fits in with a paradigm of a child being reared, where when your son is, you know, two years old and being very rude to his grandfather, you know, you have to deal with that. And if he's 19, you don't deal with it the same way as when he's two, right? And I think it's the same paradigm that we see here where Israel has to be held by the hand, spanked sometimes, disciplined in, as a part of becoming mature and growing up that we don't see later in the relationship, right? Where later it's more of a, you know, a parent to an adult child relationship where there's more partnership and there's, there's inheritance. You know, a son taking on the business of the father. It's not the same as a two-year-old who's throwing a tantrum and needs to be disciplined. And it looks a lot like you're dealing with a slave when you're disciplining a two-year-old child. Sometimes you grab them by the arm, you take them to another room, or some people believe, you know, some people spank their kids, you know, <laughs> it's corporal punishment, you know, um, but it's not. In, 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 in the Hebrew uh, laws relating to slavery, we have to actually uh, take care of the slaves before we even take care of our own children. So we have to realize that Slavery doesn't have to be the kind of slavery that Pharaoh um, shows in, in the story, but that there are much more benevolent forms um, which really combine uh, a responsibility towards, towards the slave and perhaps even helping the slave uh, learn the ways of God by, by being in, in, in the household. Um, and we see that with Noah, who, right, who, when he... Uh, in, in some ways, he curses 
uh, one of his, his grandchildren, Canaan, um, to become a slave, he's actually thinking about what will it take to, to uh, remedy uh, a certain problem that this, that this grandchild has, and he actually finds that slavery is the best way of doing it. So it's, it's, I think it really is a fascinating subject, and it's important to emphasize that the Hebrew slave, after six years, has to be set free. Or the whole notion of a slave being forever a slave is just unacceptable. It's a slave. If if there is a need for slavery, uh, then then it has to end at a certain time, and the slave is set free with gifts and with everything he needs to start his life. Because ultimately, God wants all of us to be free men and women, to be people who are capable of of, of shaping our own destiny of course, in the ways of God. That's a very, very, you know, I thought also, Yair, there's a very fine line. The, the same word for slave is the same word in Hebrew for servant. Right. Yeah. And there is a fine line when servanthood goes to slavery. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's that whole thing. You're all, there's always going to be a taskmaster. <laughs> I think this is, this takes us farther into the Torah, but you know, either you're going to serve one that is going to release you into freedom and destiny, or you're going to serve one that's going to to bring you into bondage and oppression. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that fine line can, if you get too close to the edge of that, you can find yourself on the other side. And so, yeah. Nice. Uh, Kim, you're just reminding me of John 15, 15, you know, when Jesus says to his uh, disciples, he said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I've learned from my father, I have made known to you, you know, and isn't that, you know, I, I think it's part of like with the 10 commandments, you know, do not commit adultery. And we had to, you know, there are times in history where that had to be enforced at the end of a stick, you know, or stones in some communities. Uh, and you said to go, you can always see a father saying to his son, like my son, you got to get this, this envy for your neighbor's wife out of your head. It's not good. You can't commit adultery. It's a bad idea. Don't do it. You know, pleading with people because it's for your own good. You know, it's not because I'm trying to turn you into a, a moral slave, you know. So yeah, here, I hand it back to you. No, I just wanted to add also the fact that relating, I think, what you said earlier about in, in Ezekiel, if you go to Ezekiel uh, 29, verse 13, the verse there which describes how God will gather Egypt from all of the nations where he, they have been dispersed, it's the same kind of description that God had, that the prophets have for Israel being gathered from the exiles. In other words, the, 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 the rules that God is applying to Israel uh, really do apply to all nations. God ultimately wants a covenant with all of mankind and, uh, and, and, and perhaps to prove that such a relationship of, of love and of covenant and justice and all those things that were mentioned is possible. God had to take one people and make them like the first one. So we call them the firstborn and he refers to them as they are my firstborn. But he, we, the, Jew, the Jewish people are merely meant to serve as an example for all people so that all people should enter into that loving partnering relationship with God because that's what God seeks with everyone. And maybe that's what we see with the, with the, with the pandemic of today um, in, in, in the pandemic of today, the entire world is going through this pandemic and it's completely transforming the world. You know, we want to, he's, he, God is teaching us how much we depend on each other and how we have to come together. And he teaches us how important a family is. And he, he's teaching us all kinds of things. It's almost like the world really needed a wake up call. And that's what we're getting. We're getting a wave of call because God really wants us to come out of this pandemic uh, much better people, much better societies, much better nations. But, but not only that, too, I think what you're touching on is because of what we're dealing 
with globally right now. It's a challenge for us, even as whether we're Christians or Jews or anybody from the nations, is how do we relate to God in what we're going through? And how do we relate to the leader of our nation as we go through this? And you're finding that there are a lot of opinions out there right now. Uh, I, I, I think there's more opinions on how we relate to our leadership uh, in our nation. But this challenge is there, okay? Because God wants us to relate to our nation's leaders. But he doesn't want us to idolize them. He doesn't want us to exalt them. He doesn't want us to be sheep that just follow them wherever they go. Uh, that there's a limit to their authority. Uh, and, and yet that falls under a greater authority. The one who put them into power will harden their hearts, will do whatever he wants to do, so as he can ultimately get a people to cooperate with hearing his voice and not hardening our hearts as we did in the rebellion. And, and, and this is, uh, I think it's very fascinating and it's a challenge that we're all dealing with right now. And I, I think these are great home studies with our own, within our own marriages. And I know it's a, it's a daily talk in our, across our table uh, between my wife and I is what is God speaking to us through? Is God speaking to us with this? I don't want to hear about what, how, uh, uh, dealing with this. I, I'm tired of hearing about how Trump's dealing with this. Okay. I, I want to know is what is God saying in all of this to us? Because I don't want to make those guys my idols. I don't want uh, to just follow them indiscriminately. Uh, I want to be able to know God's directions. I think we have some very interesting comments in the chat, uh, Gabe. Maybe you, you'd like to, and maybe there are questions also from uh, um, our participants. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. Can I ask? Yes, of course. Um, I think there was such an interesting insight about Shifra and Poor. I want you to ask, how do you relate that to the case of Rahab and Ruth? How do we relate that to, to them? Of the building of house, that the Lord, that uh, God built them a house, the two midwives in Egypt. I think more than a question, that's actually a beautiful thought that you're sharing with us that shows how uh, it, it, everybody has a choice, just like Ruth um, had a choice and she chose to join with the house, uh, join with the God of Israel and with the house of Israel. And uh, God not only blessed her, but he made her the the great great grandmother of uh, of of the of the king of Israel that we exalt to this very day as the father of Messiah. So we see that not only is there blessing when someone who's not born into Israel um, cleaves to the God and the people of Israel, but um, that relationship um, can actually bring forth the beginning of redemption it's uh it's amazing that's i think that's what we take from ruth and we see perhaps in 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 the case of uh of uh, shifra and fua um it's very interesting what what these these words mean does anybody know what the names shifra and fua actually mean it's on the link that um ah, cool right somebody says it's to wikipedia yeah so the Shifra actually in the Talmud, they discuss it that uh, Shifra, the word comes from the Shapel, improves. In the, in the process of birth, uh, as uh, those of us who've experienced it know, it's, you know, when the, when the, when the baby comes out, um, there's work to be done. Uh, so, and then, the, and, and, the, and, and in many ways, that's, uh, uh, so that's the Shifra. And and in the fua, there's that it's that that's kind of assisting with the, with the baby, and then in the fua is assisting the mother because the mother is going through a, an amazingly uh, challenging experience, and um, and various interesting things are said about how 
the uh, the midwife encourages the mother through the process and helps her, uh, you know, whether it's with the breathing, with the, with the pushing. And so, so you actually have here two different ways perhaps of assisting in the process of, of birth, of bringing new life into the world. Now think of that. These are two Egyptians who are helping bringing new Jewish life into the world. And, and, and they make that new life better and they help those who are experiencing the, the birth pains and so forth, help them overcome them. So it's everything that I hear from Dean all the time, you know, uh, comfort my people. And, and, you know, there are just so many ways that uh, people from the nations can help in this process because it is a process of birth. It's a process of creating a different kind of relationship between God and man in the world. We know that in many ways, we started out within a certain kind of relationship. Then we did something, which we won't talk about now because that's gonna be next week. But, and that changed the nature of the relationship. And that change, which is a change that ultimately brought about pharaohs and slavery and poverty and suffering and so many other things, God is now saying, let's go back to the original paradigm. Let's do away with whatever corruption, poison was introduced into mankind in that story that we'll talk about next week. Let's go back to that loving relationship where we actually only help each other instead of competing with each other, where we help each other prosper rather than try to oppress and to, and, and, and to, and, and to overcome the other. These are, this is a birth of something completely new. It's going to be the same laws of physics, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a completely different kind of relationship between God and man and between man and man. And it's going to be celebratory, just like we said in the very beginning. So I wanted to uh, quickly get to the comments that we're putting here. Um, Lily put two passages. She referred to one, Exodus 12, 38. Uh, which states that a mixed multitude went up with them. I think Lily was getting at that there were more than just, you know. Oh, yeah. There were a lot of logical descendants of Jacob there. Uh, and then the second verse that Lily shared, which is a really good one, uh, Ezekiel 33, 11, uh, where Ezekiel says uh, on behalf of the Lord, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. So just, just a nice nice reminder of, of God's heart. Uh, and then uh, Leo Moreno, thank you for your comment. Um, she refers to, uh, there are also plagues in the Christian uh, scriptures, the New Testament scriptures uh, at the end in uh, the apocalypse. And that um, like in the Exodus from Egypt, there seems to be two sides. There's the hardening of some hearts. And then there's the softening and the submission and the celebration of God. Uh, in another community, and uh, but uh, thank you, Leo, for that. And there are no questions from Facebook. So, thanks, guys. We really appreciate your comments. You're chipping in, so um, we're glad to share them. Good. So we have uh, literally six minutes left to our official clock. Um, maybe if we can uh, just, if we have any wrap up thoughts or if there's anyone of any of you who want to share something specific before we uh, wrap up today also it would be good if kim might uh in the last minute or so tell us if there's anything we have to do to register for the new series that's starting next week uh that might be also something worth doing before we part okay Okay, I, I think I'll do that right now since you <laughs> nice seated. I'll just do it right now, real quick. Um, so uh, what we are doing now is we are growing. Okay, so that is it's just not gonna be us four no more anymore. It's going to be we're opening our up Enoam to the to the world. We want to share insight and 
really bring everyone together to study the Torah. And Torah, uh, as has been said before, I'm just going to reiterate it real quick. A lot of people don't really know what the Torah is. It's not just the five books of the Bible, but the word Torah means instruction. It means to study, to learn, okay? Uh, and so it's the instructions of God. Now is the five books through Moshe, Rabbeinu, right? However, that's also kind of an umbrella for the whole of the Tanakh and the Jewish Bible, the study of the Torah, but it is the instructions of God. And very often, you'll find the English translation of the Hebrew word Torah is going to read law. And it's not law, it's instruction. So we want to really share and open up that understanding. And to do that, first of all, we want you to subscribe. So when you see, if you're not already subscribed, if you've subscribed in to, uh, to, to 2020, 2020. <laughs> in 2020, for the first Enoam series with Rav, uh, <clears throat> Rav Do, then uh, you don't need to subscribe again. You should be getting our emails and you should have links to the Zoom and you should be able to participate and make questions and do all these cool things. However, if you're not already subscribed, and Janie, I saw you on here, I want you to know you have subscribed so many times, you will never need to subscribe again. So <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so uh, with that said, uh, so you will see us on Facebook. You'll, the replays will be on YouTube as well. And that we're going to be uh, working on something a little more in the future. So you're going to see uh, these opportunities. Share them with friends and family. If you like this today, if you loved listening to Rob Dove and becoming involved with us in the last series, this series is going to really take it to a whole new level. So make sure you share with family and friends, get them registered so they get the Zoom link or direct them to the Facebook. Uh, we want you to be a part of this global community we're growing. All right, so did I cover everything? Do you yes, think terrific, part? did, did a great job. <laughs> we're, gonna get, we're gonna get in touch with Margaret here. All right, so, okay. That's it. And thanks so, again. Gabe. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. I think we have a Thank good, uh, yeah, thanks, Margaret. Really appreciate you joining us for the first time. May we I'm all in, soon have uh, an exodus. May we all soon have an exodus from this corona so that we can uh, <laughs> start, Let start, my people go. <laughs> start hugging our grandchildren and. Uh, and oh, family definitely. and yeah. friends. We look forward to that. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. And uh, we all go so well in America. So, hmm. Gabe, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I just wanted to welcome Margaret because uh, Dean informed me that, uh, Margaret, you plan on joining us more in the future. So we hope you had a good yes, experience. I will. You. I will. God, Hashem willing, I'll be joining you. Wonderful. God bless you. Thank you. I'll be joining you. Yeah. yeah. And thanks, all Joe, right. for all of your support, technical support. It's been wonderful. And uh, Ephraim, thank you for joining us today. Yeah. See there on the camera. Ephraim. <laughs> yeah, good and, uh, to see you, Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Hi, nice everyone. Have everybody here. Shavua Tov. Have a great day. Goodbye. Bye bye now. It's Joe. Goodbye. Return again, return again, return to the land of your soul.